We're going to, today, my presentation is coming from a CM side, the contractor side. I am a union trained carpenter with a degree in psychology. <laughs> you got it. It's a great combination, actually. Uh, so as, as you're seeing, the presentations are going to come from different viewpoints, and we're going to be repeating ourselves a little bit up here, but from a little different angle throughout the day. So you're seeing my, mine from a CM, you're going to see Andrew from an architect, you're going to see Craig from, yeah, we don't know, either, no, manufacturing, and Laverne obviously from the building science. All right, again, we want it to be interactive. Let's have a little fun when we do these. I'm, learning objectives are in the books. Let's, let's get going, because I got, Laverne always helps us out being on time <coughs> right away. These buildings worked. Can we all agree, these buildings worked for their day and age. They separated inside from outside, right? Similar to the TP Laverne showed as well. No doubts. These worked. What changed? Right? We build like this today. Right? We went from going from maybe four or five materials on the right-hand side for the enclosure to literally hundreds to build an enclosure. That's Kent State on the left, or right, correct. Okay, part of it came back in that 1970s, right? That oil embargo. They demanded insulation in our walls. They demanded we build differently than we had been in the past. A lot of the buildings built in the 40s, 50s, 60s around today are awesome buildings, right? They don't have insulation, but structurally, they're very sound buildings. As they told us now, we had to put insulation in our walls, we changed some of our materials around, we changed dew point locations, Laverne sold you some great failures, and then we found out, hey, maybe we gotta start doing stuff on the outside of walls. That's where we start looking at all the different types of materials. Think about this. We go and we think about three different types of backup walls, five different types of air barriers, four different types of insulation, and four different types of cladding. We know there's more in each of these categories, right? How many exterior walls can Andrew design? <laughs> He's showing one. But throw out some numbers. What do you guys think? How many exterior walls? I had to put this matrix together for NFPA 285. So some of the numbers crossed off. Don't multiply them. That won't be it. What do you guys think? Give me some numbers. 30, 40 walls, 50 walls? Probably hundreds I'm hearing in the front. No fear, you saw Buffalo. We, I, I came up with 116 different wall configurations. Every one of those products has multiple, multiple manufacturers, right? We just went from hundreds to thousands of walls. Every building we build today is unique. Every building. In my old job, I was the QA manager for a billion dollar construction company. Right before we left, we got a, a contract to do 10 MOBs around the city of Chicago. Yeah, call it what you want. All right, those buildings are almost all identical. The idea was to use the exact same trades on every building, get through that learning curve. But every building was gonna be unique, why? Different site, different location, and you have different manpower. I'm a union trained carpenter. I frame things different than another guy who does framing. I rocked differently than other guys hung sheetrock. We all have different experiences. Every building's unique. You're gonna hear that throughout this presentation. Real quick, I always want to give a little snapshot. You know, we're doing this for ABBA, give you a little history. Laverne gave you some of the stuff where it came from, but those crazy Canadians in the 80s started to put, hey, we got to figure out what this air thing is about. They did a nice job. In the 90s, started quantifying it. 2000, 2001, depending on who you're talking to, ABBA was born. Think about this, no standards, no codes, nothing regarding air barriers. How many architects in here got your license prior to, and I'll go say, I'll give you a couple of years, 2004. How many of you got your license prior to 2004? So for most of the people in here who rose your hands earlier, you're telling me you never had education in school regarding air barriers. They may have called it a vapor barrier or retarder, and we're finding out everybody's confusing those terms, right? But you guys weren't learning about this. Think about since 2010, where do we have? ASHRAE 90.1, 189.1, the IECC, the IBC. What code are we on here? Are we 2015 in Ohio? 12. So you're still referencing the ASHRAE standards and the IECCs for air barriers. 
in that amount of time, right, we've done all this research, we've done all these things, but think how fast that is to get it into the codes. And as Laverne said, the more we study, the less we realize we really know, which is kind of scary. Like I said, the architects in the room, it's nothing against your training. You just weren't taught the education. The research being done on air barriers is incredible. Like I said, a gentleman, Andrew, will be speaking this afternoon, the co-chair for ABBA's research council. We've got a laundry list. How many, people, how many items are on our list? About 30? Yeah, yeah. We've got about 30 different research projects we want to get going right now. We just don't have the, the manpower to do it. Get into the presentation. This is top 10 concerns I saw out in the field as a QA manager, okay? Number 10 is my brethren, the CM. We caused some of our own issues out there, right? The owner has a due date when you're bidding jobs. You gotta finish by that date. Sometimes you're pushing things you're not supposed to, right? Well, think about it, is that ready for air barrier? No, we know it's not, but if the CM's pushing, you might have to. Are these ready? Of course not. A hole's a hole, right? That's got to be patched before you put in the air barrier. The middle one, screws. Those screws aren't set properly. More importantly, exterior sheathing. I ask this question every presentation. Exterior sheathing, what is the on-center screw spacing? Throw some numbers, folks. 16, 24, 12, what do we think? You're no fun. <laughs> Gentleman in front, eight inches on center. I wish I had a prize. Very few people, most presentations I give, yeah. they're wrong. <laughs> Do you already cheat and look in there? Yeah. Eight inches on center. Go back to your job sites tomorrow and take a look at your exterior sheathing, see what they're spaced. Hmm. Yeah, most, most of the time they're not spaced eight inches on center. The only area I see that is in California where Oshpot is, the jurisdiction having authority, because they will make them rip the sheets off if not done right. It's the only place in the country I know that does that. Architects, your turn. I gotta pick on you too, all right? You guys are here today, right, to learn more about air barriers. So is it unfair to say you're trying to get more education? You might not be fully up to date with some of the research out there, like on thermal bridging. That's becoming one of the big issues in the industry right now. We'll give you some numbers throughout the presentation, see if you guys know them. or continuity. Architects, for your own QA, QC, do you take your pencil at the top of your drawing and trace the barriers, air, thermal, and moisture throughout the entire enclosure and make sure you're building a submarine above land? That's what we're doing. We are now building submarines above land and we're going to ask those mechanical guys to maybe do some calcs and give us the proper sized equipment, okay? If we're tightening up, they need to have smaller equipment. But this was a drawing back in the early 2000s I got to go and talk to the architect about. Not uncommon for most of the drawings I go through. Questions, concerns, continuity, thermal. Redundancy of barriers. Upper Midwest, we're not too bad with this. We, we might have a primary barrier behind and then bring a sealant bead in front. Down south, I see a lot of times they just use a single sealant bead. And they're hoping, right, that that substrate's clean, dry, that that's the right application for that material. Hope's a horrible plan. That's a, <laughs> that's a horrible plan. Redundancy of barriers, right? We, we gotta have them in here to make sure our, these enclosures are gonna stay effective. Because we might tell people on a maintenance O&M manual at the end of the project, hey, you have Mr. Maintenance Guy, you gotta replace sealant or go check it every 10 years. What's the odds he's gonna do it? Yeah, nah, no. Not, not until there's water running in the building. Then you might go, ooh, I gotta find funding for that. Be honest. NFBA 285, you guys run into that around here? It's been in the codes for a long, long time. Absolutely, fun, fire. Fun test, if you can get to witness it, 30 minutes of fire. It's pretty cool. Okay, be aware, architects, give us designs that meet it. Our, you know, contractors, you should know what this test is about. About 10 years ago in Milwaukee, that's where I'm from, 
uh, healthcare hospitals being built, about a third of the enclosure was built. State inspector asked the question, may I see your 285 assembly? That was around uh, about just before lunch. By three o'clock, the whole city of Milwaukee knew that enclosure was being torn down. And the inspector had every right to do that. Think you're making money on that job? Okay, understand some of these tests. I'll walk through this from right to left. I'm Polish, I do a lot of things backwards. All right, this was a reclad project that I was involved with. On the right hand side is what I call traditional construction, built 15, 16 years ago. I'm gonna go from outside in. They had a thin GFRC panel, was the facade, airspace, two by six metal stud, R19 bat, six mil poly, okay, and your drywall with paint. Can we all agree about 15, 16 years ago, that's how we built majority of our buildings, right? In the middle, it's hard to see on the screen here. You can see there's a little overspray right up here. We're coming from left to right with our reclad project. So we have the exact same wall, but with a good air barrier sprayed on the face of that GFRC panel. Okay, now the far left, nothing behind the GFRC panel, just a good air barrier and that panel. I also used to have a really fun infrared gun. Go and take some shots, it's about 15 degrees outside. Kind of cool that a good air barrier stopping the air was giving me similar thermal to traditional construction. Kind of neat, isn't it? Thinking about stopping that air movement. Kind of crazy. That's how important stopping it is. I can't find a better visual anywhere than that. Make sense? Everybody's with me on this one? Sometimes people ask me to re go over it a little bit more, so. Designers, front end specs, 01400s, right? Quality assurance, are you guys providing a nice matrix talking about your mock-up testing and your field testing, including how often you're gonna expect it, what, and what tests you're running and what that means? I bet you as a contract, Matt, would you like to see a spec like that that shows that very cleanly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let, let's not make it ambiguous. If we're doing mock-ups, we're doing field testing, don't just say we need to do it, guys. <coughs> let's get some sort of matrix in there so people can price it all properly. They know what's going to be involved. Don't see it very often. That was a spec from Architect in Milwaukee. I stole it, updated it a little bit. I mean, borrowed it. it it's great. The only one I ever saw. Modeling. You guys do much modeling? Architects, do you guys do some of the modeling? Do you ask for the models? If you guys are using curtain wall, a lot of your major window manufacturers might run Therm for you for free. You guys have quite the range of climate, just like I do in Milwaukee here. All right? So it'd be really good to know, middle of winter, can you expect frost? If you decide to do an architectural beautiful detail, right, because you want to win an award and you're sticking the windows way out and you don't have it all in thermal plane any longer, or way in and you got steel bridging over the head, you might want to run a therm so you can see. You might have condensation. Woofy, Woofy's a bullet hole straight through the enclosure. This is the way I relate it, okay, in, in, in layman's terms. It's taking every part of that enclosure from the inside paint, inside drywall, metal studs, exterior sheathing, exterior air vapor barrier, exterior insulation, airspace cladding, and looking at the hydrothermal properties for each one of those. And then you're going to take and run this model for either three to five years with your interior temperatures in summer and winter and interior relative humidities for summer and winter. And after looking at that, you're going to see, do you have potential for mold? You can run it against also that model against ASHRAE 160, which is now kind of in flux. There's been some updates to it, but the, what it was before, you could look and see if you had certain lines. You know, you're trying to stay below 80%. Okay. When you go to 2015 IBC, if you have a wall, Laverne mentioned the, the perms. And we, we're not going to get into that. It's a whole debate, discussion, if we wanted to get into it. But let's say you have properties that don't meet the, the, the normal perms, you can go and run a woofy and have your wall pass after, with the 2015 by proving it's going to work. Okay? 
You're stopping the air. You stop the air, you're gonna stop 95% of the problems in your building. Plain and simple. I don't care about perms unless I'm looking at a museum, an OR, or an atorium. I really don't, especially if you're building with exter exterior insulation. We'll get into that a little bit further. Existing buildings and modeling. Like I said, you guys have a lot of cool buildings in downtown Cleveland, right, that have been up for a long time. They really don't have any insulation in them. Fair statement? Right. We know, as, as Laverne made the comment, getting to net zero, some of these buildings are gonna need to be insulated. So what are we gonna do? There's ways to do it. The modeling can definitely help you, especially if you're doing things with brick. This brick wall, beautiful. We did a reclad going to the inside with it. No issues, no problems. This building, maybe not so much. You have to understand, different brick have different uh, softness to it. And because now you're putting insulation to the inside, you're changing the dew point, you're changing the freeze-thaw abilities of that brick. So if you have a soft brick, and you do some of this insulation for retrofitting, you could cause more damage than good. Plain and simple. Have the ASTM run on the brick, it'll give you a good rule of thumb. Looking at the existing building, if it's pretty pristine like this, it'll give you a good rule of thumb that you should, should be okay if you're gonna insulate to the inside. About three years ago, I was fortunate to be involved with a study with CBEI, ABBA, some uh, other individuals, and in IMI, International Masonry Institute. We had a group of about 12 looking at this idea of insulating existing buildings in the Philly area, Philadelphia. So we went through all different wall configurations, then we ran, we narrowed it down to cost and ease of construction down to three walls. They ran woofies on them, they put them on the test hut Laverne was talking about out in Syracuse, monitored the heck out of them for a year and came up with a nice, nice report. If anybody's interested in that report, just give me your business card with CBEI on it and I'll send you a copy of it, okay? But it gives a great example of how to retrofit some of these existing buildings that we have. Here's an, this is an example. This was one of, one of the things we talked about was putting spray foam on the inside. You basically have a mass brick wall here. This was a small little shopping area. And they came in and they, they inst put new studs on the inside, but you can see a little bit of a gap between the metal stud and the brick wall. They're going for continuous insulation. About that inch gap allows the guy, when he's spraying, to hold the stud, put just a little bit of spray behind the stud, foam expands out, catches the stud, so he doesn't bow it out. And then he's kind of filling in, that's what he's doing here. So he's actually holding and spraying, then he comes back and fills all in for the two to three inches he needs. But he's got an inch of continuous insulation before you have that metal brick, the Metal studs acting as a thermal bridge. A circle here, you have great transition. That spray foam is going to come and he's just put a tiny bit of spray around the peel and stick so it wouldn't pull off the wall. That peel and stick then goes with the sealant bead to the window. He's got that continuity, right? That submarine. There's ways to do it. There's ways to screw it up. If he sprayed two inches on that peel and stick right away, he'd probably pull the peel and stick away. He'd have all sorts of issues. Craig will get into that more. He complains if I get into that too much. Yeah. Let's look at your temperatures here in Cleveland. Right? High temperature 83, cold of 64. We're going to talk about that wall and thermal insulation. Think about this. July, you guys ever get up above 83? Yeah, you do. It gets hot, right? You have a thunderstorm roll through in the morning. Sun comes out, beats on that brick. Brick's a reservoir cladding, right? Absorbs water. Now you've got, that brick will get up to what, 120, 130 degrees? Moisture in that brick is gonna to wanna to go from hot to cold. We all agree with that? But now, I'm saying the dew point with these numbers of 80, 70% relative humidity, Laverne went over that, has a dew point of 74. If you have that six mil poly, I call that a great condensation plane, right? It's a great place for that moisture to do a phase change. This is why we saw a lot of mold in the walls. Can that happen here in Cleveland? Every day, <laughs> in summer, yeah, absolutely. Right? Winter, you see the opposite. You got these things like outlets, right? Or I see right above the gentleman here, a thermostat, or whatever penetration you got going into that outside wall. You got just the opposite. You're gonna have frost forming. Like Laverne said, hey, that snow, that ice, that's not bad. 
until the sun comes out that day. Now that wall, even though it's 20 degrees outside, warms up to 40 or 50 degrees, right? And it melts that to water. Going back to what we're seeing now in the codes, continuous insulation. I'm looking around and I see most of you brought a jacket. Kind of cool this morning, right? 25 degrees? Why don't you just drink your coffee and walk outside? Put the warmth inside you. You put that jacket around you to keep the heat in, right? Right, yeah, eat your sweater, Joe Stebrick. Don't, don't, don't eat your sweater, Dr. Joe Stebrick. When you're cold, you don't eat your sweater. You put it on the outside of you. That's all we're trying to do with buildings. We're trying to keep the stud cavity warm so we can't have that phase change within the cavity. Does that make sense? Same thing, if you could have a phase change within these materials, and you won't, I'm just showing you a theoretical location, that's about where it would be. And if you do have a little gap or crack, let's say that's a conduit coming through, so you have a little air coming through. The idea here is you have that air vapor barrier behind, so if it would condensate right here, it could drain down, and I always have to show the flashing because Craig's here, otherwise he cries. <laughs> He's a big guy to watch cry. It's not fun. Usually about 10.30 at night at the bar, it's never good. Continuous insulation. Andre Desjardins runs Oak Ridge National Labs, all right? He, he's sitting there saying you have to have a continuous. It needs to be on the outside. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. What do we mean by continuous? This is being debated in the industry right now. Okay? Depends on who you talk to. Ziegert's. It's on the outside of the building. Is it continuous? No, I would agree. I absolutely agree with everybody who says no. Vertical z girts is a 60 to 80% reduction of your thermal value. So when you do comm check, architects, for your building, make sure you reduce your thermal values by 60 to 80% if you do that. And then tell me how thick your insulation is. Right? Because nobody adds that in there when they do it. So you're not giving the owner what you actually told them. Okay? Is this continuous? This was my Masons doing this. Wait, nice boat, yeah. Well, 3 16 inch gap, that's an air leak. That's just a hole, you know, just a chunk missing. Kind of continuous, but we know if the air gets back in here, you can reduce the R value by 30%. Right, so what is continuous? It's, it's a tough question, I don't have a good answer. Do we put our steel lintel still back to structure mostly around the area? Yep. yep. <laughs> Yep, 30 to 50% thermal reduction. When you guys go home tonight, you're going to cook a nice dinner, you're going to get out your wood pans, right? <laughs> no? What are you getting out? Metal. Metal. Absolutely. Why? It conducts heat. That's called a radiator fin, folks. You've got a motorcycle or, you know, old house with radiators. That's what that is. Every floor, continuous. It goes back to your structure continuously. It's breaking past your thermal plane. We need to design better buildings. We need to build them better. You can use standoffs, 10% reduction. The steel manufacturers will actually put this little kicker right in the factory on for you. I know, that was my project. I was on that project. Asked for it. So yeah, you're also seeing uh, plastic shims, basically, is what the air. They might be not be plastic, but the chemistry. And you're seeing plates that come out, and they'll have eight holes or so, and that shim has eight holes, and you bring two plates together right at the thermal line. It, it reduces the thermal conductivity. I don't have the numbers on how great it does. But there's it, different products. Yeah, there there, there's different ways to do this, absolutely. So, but you have a smaller angle, which is cheaper, okay? Out east, this is a pretty typical way they build. We're seeing it move across the country, all right? But it's an issue. I prefer the knife plate to tubes because these are really hard for air barriers to seal up. <laughs> Matt Shaken said he's been on those sorts of projects, yeah. It's not IECC 2015 is saying you need CI everywhere, all climate zones for above grade walls, okay? In case there's some architects in here that do stuff around the country. Just so you're aware. You guys use spray foam? I gotta say yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, all right. Let's talk about spray foam. 
Fantastic product if installed properly, okay? Some of the things you need to be careful about, I'm talking thickness per pass. ABBA recommends no more than two inches per pass. Okay, there are some manufacturers who say that you can go thicker these days, very few. Most recommend no thicker than two inches per pass. What does that mean? If we're in this room here, we start in the corner, come down the wall, do two inches, but require three. By the time you're down there, you should be able to start back here to get that final inch. 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Why? Exothermic reaction, it gives off heat. I was told last night, corrected last night by some, at 208 degrees is what you need for the cells to form properly and it'll get up to what, 240? 220 for a two inch pass. So you take a guy who did this down in Texas who decided to spray eight inches on the bottom roof deck at one time. Then he calls and says, hey, I think he called the manufacturer. The roof's smoking, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first answer was get the hell out. <laughs> Second answer was call the fire department. Okay. And then my understanding is when the fire department showed up, they asked what it was, and they said, "Well, spray foam." And we don't—we're not exactly sure, but the spray foam and it started, you know, smoking and everything else. So the fire department did this. That's cool. <laughs> it's chemical fire. They don't know what it is. They are not going in. It only cost two million dollars worth of damage. So understand properties, understand manufacturer's instructions, right? That's why we want to kick that over. But if you're using spray foam, again, as an architect, put it in your specs, no more than two inches per pass. Make sense? Help yourselves out. Don't be part of something you don't want to be part of. There's a lot of lawsuits involved with that one. Yeah, so there are some high performance foams that will allow. Uh, there's some questions on their structural uh, foam, how well the foam is structurally. At four inches, if you do a four inch pass. Like I said, ABBA still only recommends two inches just to be on the safe side. Overall thickness, hey, we're talking some of these walls, especially this climate zone, they're gonna want three inches, right? Or two and a half inches, or depending on what you need for your, your comp check and your insulated values, okay? Uh, <laughs> when I was at my previous employer, this was about six, seven years ago, I got a call from my boss, says, we got you help, we hired a kid out of school. Fantastic. What are you guys studying? Architecture, I would love that. The kid had a degree in economics. <laughs> and he's gonna be quality assurance, and he's gonna be telling these guys who've been doing it for 20, 30 years, you're doing it wrong, right? A little nervous. But the first week, I could teach the kid to bend a piece of wire at three inches long, stick it into the foam, and anywhere you, you could still see wire, <laughs> paint it orange. He did a great job. Sometimes we overthink things, guys. That's the point here, right? Checking foam doesn't have to be real difficult. Hey. Stick, stick something really small in, know how thick it is, help the guy out to spray it, okay? Temperature substrates. All the manufacturers will tell you, you have certain substrate temperatures you've got to be within. General rule of thumb is 40, right, for the low end, depending on your foam, but general rule of thumb. Anything below 40 degrees as a substrate, they're telling you don't spray. Anything above roughly 85 or 90, is that right in that number, Matt? Right, depends on the manufacturer. They're telling you don't spray, okay? So there is a range. Foam, to my knowledge, needs three things. It comes in two drums. It's one of the only products we manufacture on site. Part A, part B. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Comes into a mixing unit, and that mixing unit is also has a heater on it. So you got the ratio, the heat, and then the pressure out the hose. You screw with any one of those three, you have bad foam, okay? And there are guys who will mess with it. You do a higher pressure, you might get more yield. But you won't have the foam, you won't have the weight that you need. You won't have the R value you need, okay? I walked by this site, I saw the brown, and something, I'm like, that's not right, something's weird. You can't tell the poundage of foam by looking at it, okay? Nobody can, nobody can. It's on the outside, it's close though. It's on the other side, close. Yeah, yeah. That's a pink board, blue board. Those you can. I walked by, saw the temperature at this range. Yeah, I just saw Matt's face go. Whoa. It's not even on. Yeah, it wasn't turned on. It should be up in this type of foam. was supposed to be up around the, like 130 temperature. 120 to 130. 
I did an ASTM 1622. I've got a junior in high school that could run this test in under 10 minutes. Architects, if you specify foam, this is the CYA, specify foam installer shall, that's a fun word in legal, daily check their foam, test their foam. That's a requirement of ABBA if you have a QAP project. They have to do it daily. So the only way you know if your foam is right is to test it and do this test. Cut out a section, smooth it off, weigh it, get a beaker of water, submerge it, weight divided by volume times 1,000 divided by 16 pounds per square foot. If you're around that two, two mark, if you're using two pound foam, you're good. This was 1.4. What's going to happen? After time, if we had left that foam, this is what they got to do the next day. <laughs> that foam, if they had left it, they would have moved thermally. And eventually we've had a big crack. That crack would have sounded like a shotgun. And my understanding is you would have smelled like sulfur. That's the entrance to the new emergency room. How would you like to be walking by and have that happen on your brand new emergency room entrance? So they got to do this. Anybody use, you know, that foam in a can stuff? You ever get it on your body parts even though you're not supposed to? It comes off easy, right? When your skin dies? <laughs> then it does. We planted that. Yeah, yeah, we planted that way. <laughs> Think, look at the chunks they're pulling off here. That's telling you. Matt, is foam easy to pull off a wall if it's done right? No. no. When we went above where we cut that line and tried to pull the foam, it was, it was good. <laughs> there was no doubt. Okay. Be careful when you use it. PPE, there's, this, there's a good and bad picture. You should actually have a separate air intake, not just using the face mask. So properly done. Uh, the one side is some nasty stuff. When it comes right out, as it first comes out of the hose, it's not good. You're supposed to stay away, all fully covered. I am donating my lungs to science when I die because all the crap that's in it from being a laborer, I'm taking a picture, I'm five feet away. I don't have a face mask on. I don't have, I had safety glasses on. I didn't have goggles on. I took that picture years ago. This picture's eight, nine years ago before I learned about, <laughs> hey, you're an idiot. Like I said, the stuff in... There are subcontractors that don't pay attention. There are subcontractors, absolutely. But, but PPE is, it's got to be done right, guys. This is one of those, it's chemicals being manufactured on site. You know, you're building, you're manufacturing this product, the end product on site. PPE is incredibly important. Incredibly important on this. Laverne sometimes ruins parts of my presentations. How many sides to a building? Six. Six, right? Let's not forget we're building submarines, right, above. Six sides to a building, that's not right. Everything's got to be tied together. Everything together. Not bad. They're trying. Do you guys do basements here in Cleveland? Yep. Yeah? I do in Milwaukee. Well, you go down south, they don't, right? I do in Milwaukee. Surface temp uh, what's the temperature of soil four feet down? 55 degrees, right? What's the relative humidity? About 100%. Constant temperature, constant moisture. We know there's always tons of moisture. Moisture is when I go from more to less. Concrete's a sponge. It absorbs moisture. If you don't put barriers down, sealed type, everything else, then you could have problems. How would you like to be bidding on a project? You installed this a year earlier. You're about to bid on a new project on campus, and they call you with the bubbles like this, and they're vinyl. Just need a better HVAC system. Yeah, better HVAC system. Yeah, it'll draw more. Yeah. <laughs> Right? I've seen videos of this as well. I'm a divorcee. I've had bad days, but there's like 46 staples in this little corner. Man, my shoulder would be sore. Right? This, this is not how this material gets installed. It's not the material's fault. Can the material work? I have to tell you it does. I have to tell you if you're going to use it. I will say this, the QA on it will cost you more than upgrading to a better material. If you're going to use this sort of material, I would say put your QA really, really tight and let me know those costs, honestly, because very few people install this material correctly. And when we did the joint testing with Oak Ridge National Labs and ABBA about eight years ago, they actually had to come up with different details to make sure that worked properly. But it can work if done properly. The problem is, you walk around the country, you're not going to see too many people doing it properly. And no staples. And no staples, yeah. 
Jesus. Again, here you've got you got your window. There was foam tight to the window at one point in time. They were sealing to the foam, but the air vapor barrier was back here. They weren't tying things together properly. And when we did that as a mock-up, when we tested it, it failed. Right? I walked out on site, stuff's just flopping in the air. Just put my hand behind it, take a picture. <laughs> right? If you're sealing off, trying to do the transition from above grade to below grade, make sure you're doing using the right materials that will actually stick. Again, this was an apartment complex, the picture on the right, uh, near my home, I was watching them build it. They were siding this building about 10 feet to the right. Every apartment unit had two of these vents coming out. They were not sealed off. There's just big holes around them. Gee, I wonder where the mold's going to start. You betcha, right there. Craig and I have a bet. We're trying to figure out which one was going to get arrested first. Because we both go up to sites all the time with our cameras, taking pictures. <laughs> right? And right outside the fence, if it's not ours, if it, you know. Telephoto lens. Yeah, I've started to get that nicer camera. <laughs> then you're sitting in the car with this telephoto lens, and there's still. It's kind of funny though. Sometimes I pull up, I do that, and I watch everybody kind of scatter because you think you're, you know, OSHA or something. And, but seriously, one of these days, it's gonna be bad. I, I bet on Craig though, because he's the flasher, so he's, you know, it's a whole different story. That's flashing guy. Right he's the flashing <laughs> guy. Flashing guy. Sorry. <laughs> Self-adhered. Peel and sticks. Peel and sticks, self-adhered. Not sure what you guys phrase you use around here. Kind of interchangeable. Stick and peel. Stick and peel. Yeah, we'll get to that one in a second. Uh, a hole is a hole is a hole. We see this happen quite a bit out on sites. Oops, we set a flashing at the wrong height. We set Z-Gert wrong height. All right, just unscrew it, lower it, and we're good to go. Folks, a hole is a hole is a hole. That's a hole. I don't care what you call it. It's a hole. We don't have cool GI Joe nanotech technology that, that makes things knit together. Not yet. I'll tell you, Oak Ridge is trying to figure it out right now. First manufacturer to figure that out, that's pretty cool. We don't have it today though. That's a hole. Follow your manufacturer's recommendations for patching holes, right? You can't leave holes, plain and simple. If you see sealant behind a peel and stick, to help it stick, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's not working, right? That, that's not the way it's supposed to go. Plain and simple. You got problems. You got issues. Fish mouths. We can see how these fish mouth comes right back and inside. This is all tented here. You can see how all these air leaks and potential water leaks go right back to the inside. Right? The guy probably didn't roll it. He did. You know, he should have fixed that. He didn't. Well, he did after I took the picture. Okay. He was in a hurry. Now I'll say this: If Beck. Cleveland does a rodeo, you do some of these mock-ups like this, and we give peel and stick to the architects. <laughs> I hear some guys laughing. It's a challenge. That's craftsmanship to get that inside corner plus a horizontal that, and get it flat. That is not easy, okay? That's, that's not an easy detail. Not at all, okay? That's still wrong, <laughs> what you see there, right? But that's not an easy detail. We're looking down a wall to a horizontal, oh. right down to the funnel. Yeah, reverse, lap. <laughs> reverse lap. Hey, construction happens. Do you not think there's reverse laps on construction? Absolutely. The why I use this picture is let's look right next to it in the green circle. They cap sealed it. They talked to the manufacturer, said, hey, if you cap seal it, you'll be okay right now. The point here is it's not the best way to do it, but there's ways to fix things. If you come up into construction that you go out of sequence, out of norm, right? Talk to your manufacturers. They want to help. They will help you with details. Manufacturers are, most of the manufacturers I know and the guys in this room, we're all national, right? Yeah. So chances are we've seen the issue somewhere else in the country. We've had to deal with it. We can come up with a good fix. Give a call, all right? How are we doing on time? I don't see the signs going up yet. Thank you. Rolling, there's all sorts of air bubbles. That's actually a water bubble, it's hard to see here. You gotta roll, okay? If, if they're doing a little hand pad on it, you might as well be doing one of these at the same time. Back to the yeah. Use your razor knife. Yeah, use back your razor knife, yeah. They should have a roller, they should be pressing it in, they should be using elbow grease, roll it. Okay? We need to make sure you guys are doing these things right. 
Self-adhered. Uh, primer goes on the underside if you're using primer. <laughs> this was one of Laverne's pictures. He got called out on the project. There was no primer installed that required primer. Not all PL6 require primers these days. Most still do. Know the install directions. But if you need primer, it should go underneath the material. That little white is the backing of the peeling stick. They never peeled. They just tried to stick and then wondered why it wasn't sticking. <laughs> Guys, these are real pictures from real job sites. We all go, oh, right? But it, it happens out there. It's kind of scary. Again, primer. If you're required to use primer, make sure they're using it, that it's thick enough, it's heavy enough, okay? It shouldn't be real thin if it's required. Compatibility, again, we're going to harp on this a little bit. I rarely see a project single sourced, right? So if you're using multiple products from multiple vendors, multiple manufacturers, get compatibility letters. General rule of thumb, the guy on top is providing the letter. Right, Dante? We've had that, I've had, I had to get, make sure I was clear on that at one point in time. And a lot of people asking for them. General rule of thumb is the guy on top. Okay, get them. Architects require a compatibility matrix. How many of you have that in your spec? Why don't you? You're the one providing, hey, you can use product A, B, and C from three different manufacturers. Some of that liability goes back on you. Okay. Uh, know what the materials are, can be used for. Architects, window spacing, window to adjacent wall. Can we say anywhere from half inch to three quarter inch is your normal gap between that? Marcy, peel and sticks, general rule of thumb, how much of can they bridge? Quarter of an inch. So peel and sticks, general rule of thumb, and that's like 99.9% .9 of us, you can only span a quarter inch. So if you're saying use a peel and stick or self-adhered from a window to a wall that you have minimally a half inch, everybody doing the math with me? You've just requested something that doesn't work properly in your specifications and on your details? I love when I mark up plans and the architect gives me a little bit of attitude and I look at him and say, I'll build it like you drew it. Oh, sometimes we get a lot, yeah, these guys up here, they're laughing, right? You, you guys have to make sure you understand the limitations of materials you're putting in your specifications, what they can and cannot be used for, okay? So make sure people that we know what our materials can and can't do. Substrate prep, again, fluid applied, and I gotta speed up because I only got like 10 minutes. And I got half hour worth of material. All right, substrate prep. I walked on the job site, the guy was actually leaving, the air barrier installer was leaving. Does that look right with all the holes, gaps, and cracks? Look at the I-beams. There was nothing filling in out of the I-beams. He should have never touched it. He should have looked at the CM and said, this is not ready for me, and walked away. We already speed up. Gaps. Hey, if you're using a fluid applied, know what kind of gap bridging it can and can't do. Because if you go to the inside after somebody sprays and you can see out through the wall, that's not a good sign. Okay? Again, we're going to thicknesses. Know what the wet mill thickness is if the guys are doing fluid applied. Slumping's not a good thing. They're putting it on too thick generally. This guy's doing an awesome job. He actually had a gauge with him. And I sat and I watched him work. And every so many feet, he'd stop and check his wet mill gauge. Wet mill. If you're walking on site as an architect, as a contractor, and they don't have a wet mill gauge, I'd be really curious. Missing a membrane. I think he actually had a sealant in here, but yeah. Yep. Adhesion and cure time, right? You can do different things to make sure you're sticking properly. D4541, we're going to talk about that in a middle minute. Know the weather. We all have phones. We all can get the weather on our phone instantly. If you're using a fluid applied and you're going to have a thunderstorm roll through in about three hours and you tell the guy he has to install, he installs it because you demanded it because of schedule and it rains and then suddenly it's all on the ground, right? Yeah, it looks like pudding, yeah. You didn't give a chance to work. Yeah. Get some more material. Get some more material, yeah. Pre-installation meetings. 
For me, pre-installation meetings are critical. This is a meeting that the architects are invited, but I tell you guys, you're not redesigning at this point in time, okay? Please come and sit and listen so you get the background from everything that's being talked about. But we also invite things like the masons, air barrier contractor, glazer, roofer, right? Electrician and plumber. Why would I invite those guys? Poking holes, yeah. Head of my hammer is perfect size to run conduit through. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Remember, I came up through the trades. I won't tell you why I know. You can guess. All right? Have them all there. You might want to talk about that. Hey, guys, if you penetrate these barriers, you guys need to come back, tell somebody so they get fixed properly, and release those guys early in the meeting. Right? But they should be there and understand the importance of them damaging the, the enclosure. Okay? Very critical. It's great to have a template if you can have one. Follow up and make sure you're following certain sequencing. We always put out the plans and started, hey, we're gonna start scheduling here. First window, who's got the window wall detail? Who's got the head flashing detail? Get to the roof. In this case, that detail, this roof detail, this parapet. But this, this detail took 45 minutes, okay? With everybody in the room talking about it. Because contractors wanna come in and get out once. Some of the contractors had to come back multiple times. They didn't like it, but when they sat in that room and talked about that detail, they understood it. It allowed that construction to go, to go well. Window to wall detail, window to wall, same thing. You should have a nice schedule. Each color is a different trade. They followed each other, really nice. Beautiful pull schedule. That's my favorite picture of the whole presentation. <laughs> I love this group. Not so much that side for this question, but this side. How many of you have kids that drive? Come on. Rick, put your hand up. I know you got somebody who drives, right? Thank you. You guys built a car for them in the backyard, right? <laughs> Told your oldest one, good luck? No, you got a car with you know, analog brakes, airbags. You maybe looked at what the crust, um, crash test dummies did. That's your mock-up. Your mock-up is kind of like that. You're, you just don't want to throw something together. Your mock-up is giving you that chance to do this unique building. Remember all those walls, 116 different walls? We didn't talk about manufacturers. Nobody's built them all. Nobody's designed them all. This gives you that first chance. Here's a better number. I had an owner yesterday in the, in the presentation, uh, sitting in the crowd, and she's like, that's what she just said. She goes, wow. 93% of your mock-ups. 93% of these little wall areas, maybe an eight, eight wall, that the installers know is going to be tested. These guys build the small little area, and they know it's going to be tested. 93% fail. I've done hundreds of mock-ups. My personal experience, that's low. Being honest with you, you need to build them. They need to be part of projects. They absolutely do. All sorts. Here's a material test. Here's I call them uh, first run study. They actually got the window early, put it in, put the air barrier, put the tie-ins, tested it right on the building. Good and bad. If you're using materials you've used all the time, good. You're trying out new materials, bad, because that material fails. You gotta go back to shop drawings, right? Doesn't help your schedule. This is what we're seeing more and more, on-site mock-ups, okay? And then we've got the big boy at a big test labs, a couple of test labs all, you know, all over the country. I had a superintendent who would do, no matter what project he was on, build a little four by four wall and make the glazer come in and show him how he's doing it. Every project, right? That's where you see a lot of weeks, leaks, window to wall. That's where you see a lot of water. You wanna make sure they understood fully the system, what they were doing, not tested, he still had tested mock-ups. This would come before the tested mock-up. It was great. See all the lines and dashed lines? I mean, these screens are pretty big. You go a normal size monitor, that's really hard to follow. Very difficult detail. Uh, the manufacturer said only one architect they, that had to do, that they knew of, used that detail. They had to do special testing for it. That's what it looks like out in the field. They used this mock-up, it wasn't tested, but we got the sequence of construction right. Multiple reasons to do mock-ups, other than to look at colors. Okay. First major mock-up I was involved in, this is also in NIBS Guideline 3, the 2006 edition for commissioning the building enclosure. I was told I'd be out in the Pennsylvania area for six to eight weeks. I'm from Milwaukee, so I'm flying out every week. By the time you built it, it was one of the biggest mock-ups at the time they'd ever done. By the time you build it, you test it, it fails, you fix it, you retest it, about eight weeks. 
I went out there 16 of the 17 weeks it took for us to pass. Okay? And we hit the trifecta. Orange. We built it like they drew it. They didn't, they didn't draw a submarine. Architects didn't draw a submarine. It wasn't all connected. Built like it was drawn. Failures. Materials. The green. Glazed in metal panel. Major curtain wall manufacturer. Everybody in this room would know them if I gave you the name. Right in their shop drawings. Right over the metal panel in the plane that it was in, they used a spacer. Put the screw through the spacer through the back mull. Every screw was a leak. Right from the shop drawings. Manufacturer had to change the way they were doing that. Then my brother and the installers, we were probably guilty of 65% of the issues. Okay? We hit the trifecta, folks. Learned a ton. What you're seeing on the right is the general testing. The purples you see more in labs. The blacks are what you really see in the field. They're pretty equivalent. If you're an ASTM guru, you might know the differences, but they're really pretty close. On-site mock-ups again. Real quick story with this one, eight by eight wall, just the window, they're checking the blind brick ties going through exterior insulation. Young field engineer, right out of school, told him 93% of these fail. He's thinking, man, that's an eight by eight wall, that's not a problem. Testing agency comes out, tests it. It was the owner of the agency. He looked at me, he goes, Brian, that's one of the tightest air tests I've ever done. Right, I watched this young kid grow to be Samson, man, just, he's, <laughs> I'm at 7%. I looked at Tim, I said, you want to throw water on it? He starts smiling. Yeah, let's, let's throw some water on it. Three leaks. Air doesn't equal water, water doesn't equal air. Understand, air tests, you're allowed some air leakage. Okay, even some ASTMs for water, you're allowed some water leakage. On our projects, we allowed zero water leakage for the company I used to work for. We didn't care what the ASTM said. We did a lot of hospital work, and there's not a hospital out there that wants water coming in. Okay? Mock-ups, I'll go through this pretty quick. Again, $14 million project, about 12.5 to build the mock-up. They poured the mud slab when they're pouring the footings. Doesn't cost that much extra to get that little bit of concrete. Build it, test it, what are they looking at? Parapet the roof, parapet the wall, roof scupper. Superintendent added that, that wasn't in the original mock-up. Through wall flashings, new Z furring at the time, lintel bracket, a newer air barrier system at the time. Punched window tie-in, curtain wall tie-in, wall to foundation, and compatibility. Holy moly, that's a lot of stuff. Oh, it failed, by the way. That's a lot of learning, though. A lot of sequencing, a lot of making sure people understood when we get to the actual building, we do it right. So we don't have failures there. That's why we're doing the mock-up. Do the failures on the mock-up, not on the actual building. Dynamic water, you've got the fan blowing 77 miles an hour, throwing about five to seven inches of rain per hour. I was told in Tampa when I talked about this, hey guys, that's a class one hurricane. It's a great test, I love it. Deflection tests with pressures, you can see metal panels sucking in, pushing out, and then do air and water after that, right? What does it happen when our buildings get these big gusts of wind and back, or thermal expansion contraction? Can we still get them to work? Thermal testing. Liquid nitrogen, that big mock-up I showed a minute ago, they take that insulation about two feet off, cool it down between, gauge it on the inside, see if you're getting condensation. Then you bring it back to normal temperature, they throw a torpedo heaters in, and run it up to about 110, 120 degrees. You guys think you might have from zero to, you know, these materials when the sun's in the middle of summer hitting them, 110, 120 degrees on them? Right, that's what you're doing, the expansion contraction. And then air and water after. When should we test a mock-up? Not now, let's put it that way. We had failures. Now we're ripping and cladding off. Think we might be doing more damage? Now I'm chasing additional leaks later, right? That was all the leaks from that mock-up. Do it here. Primary barrier, we should pass. All right, you know, window to walls, roof to walls, right, foundation to walls. All those things should pass at this, with the pressures we test to normally. Okay, if you have blind fastener systems or you're going through insulation, Go ahead, cut out like a two by two piece of insulation. Put a couple in. You just don't need to clad the whole thing. Bubble gun test, smoke test, I love this. If you're a contractor, Halloween time, you can go get a smoke generator for about 25 bucks from any Halloween store or hardware store. Some tape, steal the hose off your shop vac, you can do your own smoke tests. That's all it is. If you're out in the field, the in-situ testing, 
Yeah. Water, you're pulling a pressure on the inside. Again, different types of testing. Transitions is my number one issue. How often, if, when you're involved with buildings and enclosures, how often do you see a leak in the middle of the wall? I was never involved with one of those. It's always transitions, 99.8% of the time. Okay, this one little corner of this little wall, I, I got nine different transition areas. This was a mock-up. Hey, all the five different transition areas there, I walked up, I looked at the details, I see that little dotted line, the primary barrier, a little dotted line. Let's think about how smart that is. The primary barrier is one of the thinnest, hardest lines to see on the print. Hey, they missed foundation to wall. Glad we caught it there. Again, we talked about below grade, sealing things off. This was a project out in Oklahoma, Weather Center. About four story building, that little, about eighth inch, a little bit stronger, an eighth inch gap between a metal panel system, it was, wasn't sealed. Every time it rained from west east, there was about a four foot radius of water that entered that office. They thought there was something wrong with the sidewalk. They replaced the whole sidewalk to start with. Yeah. They didn't have a good transition. That's just paint from foundation to backup wall. They didn't have a continuous. They didn't build a submarine. Again, transitions at the foundation, the wall. I walked through. There was sealant here. They told me it was good. It's hard to see on the screen. There was a gap there and a gap there. This is how we build, right? There's ways to make that transition and seal it. There's products out there. But it's not easy. If you're just going to use a sealant bead here, I don't know how you're going to do it. That, I think, is impossible. Now, is that a bad design? I'm going to say it's really not. It's difficult to get the air barrier back to the backup wall, but if he brings in two or three inches of rigid insulation, he's going to be in plane with the center of glass, right? Which is where we want our thermal plane. It's not necessarily a bad design. We just got to make sure you guys are using the right products and, and asking for the right details to get that transition properly. Silicone membranes helping that. You've got, uh, Conair actually kind of shows one. There's things out there. Hey, I got the joy of this. That's uh, Marquette Dental Building at Marquette University. I installed that uh, 16 years ago. Yeah, well, we weren't talking about this stuff 16 years ago, were we? Do we think the sealing beads are in the right location? I sealed to brick, a porous material. No, I sealed it per the architect drawings. We got to rip the windows out you know, about five years ago and redo it, All right? Don't seal the porous materials. You gotta have that continuity from window to wall, window to backup wall, something like this right in between. Penetrations, I think we hit that home already. Turn bars, Craig, since I'm almost out of time or I'm out of time, I'll leave turn bars to you. How's that sound? We fight for certain topics. <laughs> since I go first, normally I get them. Flashing details. We got the flash we're going to be talking about later, but I'll hit this one. This was another uh, National Weather Center. A window curtain wall system, when it rained from north to south, window, big window system, not huge, but decent sized curtain wall system leaked. One story. Had them pull out the whole window, put it back in, it leaked. That's a stone header above the window, and you got the lintel, right, and the brick above that. What we found out was A, weeps were too high, B, there's a membrane that stops on the lintel. On the details, it shows that membrane coming to this head and the sealant being in front of it. They didn't do it. So every time it rained, the water came down this wall to the back, down the back side of that stone header, into the head of the window system, down the jams, and came out the bottom. When we were testing, we weren't, water, we weren't spraying water up here. We were spraying water all around the window down here. So we'd have them reinstall the window. It tested fine until it rained. Leaks sometimes can be tricky. Again, this is showing the standoff. This was done in 2005 using the standoff. Continuous insulation will run right behind that. It can be done, folks. It can be detailed beautifully. Not the material's fault. The carpenters installed this, not air barrier guys. I showed the picture because it was my carpenters. My air barrier crew was literally 15 minutes away. The PM on the project was in too big of a hurry to call the right guys to install the product properly. Okay? It's not the product's fault. Product works great when installed properly. Okay? Again, another flashing story. Through wall flashing. I even highlighted it. We looked after we had some issues here. The flashing stops right here in the middle of the brick. 
We think he got caught somewhere, just decided to, to grind out some of the mortar, stick a little piece in, and walk away. Like Made it look like it was there. So that means every time it rained, it was coming down that backup wall, going down four stories, landing on a table. Vestibules, make sure you guys, if you're doing design vestibules, make sure everything's connected. A lot of times with vestibules, you stop right above the wall where the doors are, you're not sure what to do. Make sure you get continuity, otherwise you get ice down here. Continuity for that. I don't even know what to say on this picture. I just like throwing it in there. If you design something like that, you got all these parts and pieces coming together, all different planes, all different things. I got no clue how you're sealing that or sealing it well. Yeah, neither does the roofer. Nobody does. That is a, just a fun shot. Seal things over. In this case, you really get the over the wall situation. But you got roofing coming up. I think they should have put a cap bead of sealant there or a term bar with a cap bead of sealant. Okay. Zurich Insurance pays out hundreds of millions of dollars every year in construction claims, 70% due to the moisture. Think about that number. That's one insurance company in the country. There's other big ones, same situation. There are attorneys, they're getting paid lots of money every year for these issues. It is huge. The question mark here is what am I missing with this wall? Drip edge. Drip edge? Well, drip edge would mean what? Flashing, Flashing right? Weeps? I hear somebody say weeps? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're wrong, all of you. They're there. We made them remove brick to prove it. It's just buried. They poured the concrete sidewalk right over it all. <laughs> that happens. I'm not going to get too much into the rework because I am over time. We have Marcy for five minutes here before we eat. But basically understand, nobody can track a rework accurately. It's impossible. But the stats are out there. Two to 20% of your project total comes to rework. Okay? I use, I'll, I will go through this real quick. I'm a carpenter, union trained carpenter. I went through an apprenticeship. If I screwed something up, I'd fix it for the journeyman. Journeyman screwed something up, I get blamed, I'd fix it. Foreman's walking around, he saw something wrong, he talked to the journeyman, I got blamed, I had to go fix it. Architects are about to come out, so superintendent walks the site. He sees something wrong, goes down the hill, right? It gets fixed. Architects, when you walk site, you ever leave little love notes, little honey do lists? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's rework. Nobody can track it accurately. Anybody tells you they can, I'm sorry, I always just kind of giggle at that point in time. Thank you for today and, and listening to the presentation. I do want to just mention the ABBA conference. Uh, we are, all the speakers, well, I know Craig and I will be here this afternoon after it's all done. Uh, we're here during lunch. Real quick, we're going to have Tremco uh, provide just a couple minutes as a thank you for the sponsorship. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it.